eventual goal as complexity theorists uh, is is to prove explicit lower bounds for uh, functions in uh, uh, np let's say yeah and uh, the the approach from this query and communication world is we prove lower bounds in restricted models of computation where we know how to prove lower bounds and uh, communication is is a nice friendly model where we know how to prove explicit lower bounds so uh, that's not the motivation for today's talk though yeah so so why communication complexity uh, um i'm going to stand on the shoulders of giants here and the giants whose shoulders i'm going to stand upon were awarded the Abel Prize two years ago. They are Lovash and Wigderson, both of whom have worked on communication com communication complexity. Uh, Lovash wrote a survey on communication complexity in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I'm not going to read these out. Uh, this is uh, an excerpt from this, his survey. Uh, Wigderson wrote a book recently in which he has a whole section devoted to communication complexity. Yeah, as you can see, it has several applications everywhere. Uh, including practical ones like VLSI, chip design, and so on. Yeah. Um, so, in fact, the function that I'll talk about today, I'm only going to focus on theoretical aspects, but uh, I'm sure you can imagine that this function equality is very practically useful. More about that later. So, now um, recall from a few minutes ago before the technical difficulties that Alice and Bob are trying to compute uh, F via executing a protocol. Uh, a communication protocol pi. So the correctness, so we can have various correctness requirements in the deterministic setting. Uh, like I said, we require that pi outputs the correct answer over all inputs that Alice and Bob could have got. Yeah. And the cost of a protocol is the maximum number of bits transmitted over all x, y. Uh, now there's two different randomized models we could consider. Uh, one is where Alice and Bob jointly ha have uh, infinitely long common random string that they see. Um, and another is the model of private randomness where Alice has her own source of randomness, Bob has his own source of randomness. This is going to be a little important, the distinction between these two uh, for our results. And uh, when they have access to randomness, the correctness requirement gets relaxed a bit too. Uh, the, the usual notion that you would expect. For all inputs, you require your algorithm or protocol to be correct with probability at least two thirds. And uh, the quantum model is a generalization of the randomized model where above randomness, Al Alice and Bob may share prior entanglement and messages can be treated to be qubits. So, But I'm not going to get too much into the quantum model today. So here's a bit of notation. D of F is the minimum cost protocol uh, for computing F, deterministic protocol. R epsilon pub is uh, the minimum cost protocol that uses public coin randomness and solves F to probability to error epsilon. So sorry, I didn't mention it here. But if you replace two thirds here by epsilon, that's an epsilon error protocol. You're right, sorry, yes, one minus epsilon, correct. So the error is epsilon, yeah. Good, thanks, people are uh, paying attention, thank you. Yeah, so that's uh, R epsilon with uh, public randomness, similarly R epsilon with private randomness. And uh, these are the quantum variants. Uh, in case you're interested, this is the version where Alice and Bob do not share prior entanglement, but they have access to private randomness. And this is the version where only Alice is allowed to send a message to Bob. And this can only be a pure state. In case that didn't make sense, don't worry. Good. So now uh, here's an opportunity to tell you about a lower bound technique for communication complexity, a general one. And at the same time, I'm going to introduce this well-studied equality function. So our setup has a function on uh, uh, distributed input, let's assume that they are n bits each. Uh, so for such a function, I'm going to define a 2 to the n cross 2 to the n matrix, which is called the communication matrix of F. Yeah. So the rows are indexed by all possible Alice inputs. The columns are indexed by all possible Bob's inputs. And the x comma yth entry is just f of x comma y. Yeah. So let's see via an example what this is. And uh, the example is the equality function. 
um and the communication matrix is simply the identity matrix right i hope this is clear and the equality function in general is very important like you can imagine uh, two servers having strings and they wish to know whether the strings are equal or not whether strings corresponding to files or if maybe if you enter your password on a system and then there's some server that needs to check the password is correct um the main bottleneck could be the communication between your local computer and the server yeah so there's several practical motiv motivations for equality uh, and i'm saying these things for a reason because uh, in complexity theory one usually doesn't care about tiny log factors we will today uh, in fact we'll be caring about a few constants as well so here's the communication matrix of equality um now generally a communication protocol looks like this uh if you attended swagatos talk by any chance yesterday this will look extremely similar to what he called a decision tree um it is a similar object here uh, so a protocol this is a protocol tree uh how does it run so the protocol tree has a root which dictates which player starts the communication so alice always starts the communication depending on her input she sends either a zero or a one to a bob and in this tree if she sends a one then again it's alice's turn to speak uh if she sends a zero it's bob's turn to speak and they go down to this subtree and then they proceed until they hit a leaf at which point they output the value at uh, at the leaf yeah so this protocol tree over here computes a function on distributed inputs which is defined as the function that evaluates to one if and only if x comma y reaches a one leaf in this protocol that they executed okay let's assume that yes let's assume that the messages are one bit because if you assume strings then you could still model that here because i'm allowing for alternate alice nodes as well uh so let's take a closer look at what what are the possible inputs that could reach a leaf um so there's two colored edges here for some reason it looks like we can see colors more clearly today so uh this a to b 0 and this a to b 1 um alice has a set of particular xs for which she takes these inputs uh, these edges and bob has a particular set of inputs for which he takes these edges yeah and if you think about it the set of inputs that reach this leaf is just a product set the product of these two in, uh, input sets yeah so it's all pairs x comma y such that x would have taken these two edges and y would have taken the two blue edges huh? now if you look at uh, this in the communication matrix of f uh, it's just a bunch of ones in a sub matrix that's a subset of rows cross subset of columns like this so one leaf corresponds to a rectangle that is monochromatic that's that has the same value everywhere uh, another easy thing to see is that all leaves correspond to disjoint input so no leaves overlap so another leaf could correspond to this rectangle here now if you look at all the one leaves this is another example so um you don't need to have contiguous rows or contiguous columns rectangle is just subset of rows cross subset of columns so in the end uh, what is the communication matrix it's just the sum over all one leaves of the corresponding monochromatic rectangles right because the leaves uh, the rectangles are all disjoint um and every input one input must go to one of these one rectangles yeah no uh, so the zero is the bit that alice sends to bob that depends on her input x so i'm just looking uh, so this is the transcript this is a possible transcript of the protocol so this zero really it depends on what alice's input x was this one really depends on bob's what bob's input y was so there is a set of xy pairs that uh 
for which the protocol has this particular transcript that leads to this leap. I'm saying that set of XY that le lead there is a monochromatic rectangle. No. No, the bits that uh, the, like this red edge is taken by Alice for a particular X uh, set of X's. Like the protocol could be such that um, Alice could could send a zero if the first bit of our input is zero, send a one otherwise. It could be an arbitrary. We can talk offline if. Uh, if Okay, good. So now the communication matrix is not nothing but the sum of all one leaves and uh, uh, sum of all rectangles corresponding to one leaves. And each of these rectangles, like I said, is a rank one matrix. And by subadditivity of rank, this implies that if you had a depth C protocol, depth is the cost of the protocol. You have at most two to the C many leaves because it's a binary tree. So your communication matrix has rank at most two to the C. Yeah. So here we have already our uh, lower bound technique for communication complexity. If you can show that the rank is large, then the communication complexity is large. Okay. So, and in the other direction, uh, there is uh, a, a not trivial, but reasonably easy upper bound on communication complexity by rank. So D of F is at most rank of MF. And uh, in 2016, in a beautiful work, uh, Lovett showed that uh, communication complexity is at most square root of rank times log of rank. And this log was removed three weeks ago. It's on archive. Uh, seems to be a nice paper. I haven't read it yet. Okay. So yeah, it's a very happening area of research. People are always working. Good. So now uh, I'm going to relax the notion of rank a bit. So whatever I talked about on the previous slide about uh, deterministic proto protocol trees and all was all for deterministic communication. Uh, so first I want to define this notion called approximate rank. Uh, let's suppose I give you a matrix that has zeros and ones. And uh, I give you the power to change zeros uh, such that any zero entry becomes a value that's between minus one third and plus one third. And any one entry becomes a value that's between two thirds and four thirds. And your task is to minimize the rank of the matrix while doing these operations. And the minimum rank you can obtain by doing these operations is called the approximate rank of M. So I could have replaced one third here by epsilon. That would be the epsilon approximate rank of M. Yeah. And just like deterministic uh, communication complexity is at least log rank, you can show that, uh, sorry, there should be a private here. This is the private coin communication complexity of F is at least log approximate rank. And if you had private coin epsilon error, this would have been log epsilon approximate rank of M. And Burman and DeWolf showed that similar techniques to this proof here. Uh, you can show that half times this is a lower bound on uh, this, this quantum epsilon error private communication complexity as well. So this gives us a lower bound technique for communication complexity in general, rank and its variants. And uh, the focus of this talk is going to be the lower bound, the lower bounds themselves. Uh, let's see how they apply to the equality function. So recall that equality is just one if the two strings are equal, uh, zero otherwise. And the communication matrix is identity, uh, which is a two to the n dimensional identity. So it's a rank, as I'm sure all of you know, or almost all of you know, is uh, n, uh, 2 to the n. So the log rank lower bound implies that deterministic communication complexity of equality is at least n, which is tight, okay? Dis discounting a plus 1 possibly. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about tightness on the next slide. Uh, now, what about randomized private coin? Um, so there's a nice work by Alon from 15 years ago or so that says the epsilon approximate rank of the two to the n dimensional identity matrix is at least this quantity here. So for n constant, it's like logarithmic in the dimension roughly. And uh, this uh, from Krause's result on the previous slide by the log approximate rank lower bound, this implies 
this lower bound on the communication private coin epsilon error communication complexity of equality um we'll talk about tightness on the next slide and uh, since half log approximate rank is a lower bound on the quantum complexity this is the lower bound on uh, yeah all right so I, i'll talk about it on the next slide yeah. thanks so so public coin is uh, for equality happens to be less interesting than private coin uh, for a reason um, so deterministic uh, communication complexity is n plus 1 uh, and the upper lower bound is n which is essentially tight so yeah public coin communication complexity of equality is uh, order log 1 by epsilon and this is not very hard to see maybe i'll sketch a proof already verbally so alice and bob have two n bit strings using using public randomness alice and bob can jointly sample a subset of input bits now alice just sends the parity of that subset to bob and bob checks whether these his parity on that subset is equal to alice's or not so if the strings were equal these parities will always match if the strings were not equal it's easy to check that the probability of a mismatch is half so alice and bob just repeat this log 1 over epsilon times uh, if there's any mismatch the output strings are not equal otherwise they're equal and the probability of success is 1 minus epsilon error probability is epsilon uh, now there was a nice result from newman uh, around 20 to 25 years ago um, that says for all purposes except those in this talk uh, you can convert um, public coin protocols to private coin protocols at a small overhead so um, for functions for which the public coin communication complexity is like super logarithmic let's say root n or so just with an additive log n essentially you can assume the private coin communication complexity is also at most root n so this is interesting in its own right but um, the specific parameters that were shown are shown here so it's an additive version and if you relabel this if you want a multiplicative version um, this is what it boils down to so if you are willing to take a 1 plus delta multiplicative hit in the error then you pay for it by a log n over epsilon square delta square uh, additive factor in the public coin communication complex okay and uh, this version for example you can find in kushlevich nisan's book okay so what does this imply for uh, equality so equality is log 1 over epsilon protocol turns out to be tight so public coin plug in log 1 over epsilon and uh, let let's say delta is 1 so then you'd get a log n over epsilon square from here so adding these up you get log n over epsilon cube yeah but the lower bound from the approximate lo rank lower bound on the previous slide is log n over epsilon square there's this additional term here this let's ignore it for now so there's a gap between the best known upper bound and lower bound for epsilon error communication complexity of equality and while th this might look like insignificant bounds i just want to stress that equality is a very fundamental question of a problem in com communication complexity so it's it's worth trying to understand its communication complexity exactly yeah good so what do we show we show an improved version of newman's theorem uh which is directly a multiplicative version of newman's theorem uh where newman would have got an epsilon square delta square hit in this denominator of the log we just get a epsilon times delta square that's the key takeaway and as a corollary if you plug in epsilon this quantity to be epsilon by 2 and let's say delta to be 1 uh you get that the private coin epsilon error communication complexity of equality is at most log n over epsilon square plus order 1 so that um yeah so that almost matches the lower bound up to this log log 1 over epsilon term and plus constants and similar ideas show that the quantum private uh, coin epsilon error communication complexity of equality is essentially tight again discounting this log log 1 over epsilon term so uh, can i take 5 minutes thanks okay so uh, i will not uh, 
do the whole proof, unfortunately, but I'll sketch the proof. Um, here's the idea. So you want to start from a public coin protocol and you want to convert it to a private coin protocol. Uh, but uh, there's an issue, this public coins that Alice and Bob have access to might be extremely long. So how do you convert it to a private coin protocol with a small blow up? And this, this was indeed the intuition uh, that I take away from Newman's proof as well. Um, Sample a few random strings from the same distribution as R. And now um, you would expect that each of, uh, okay, so maybe I will do the proof a little bit. So define this indicator function uh, parameters by J, X, Y. Uh, this is basically telling you is the Jth random string R, J here bad for X, comma Y in the sense if your protocol had randomness rj, so I'm assuming here that all of the randomness is uh, sampled in the beginning of the protocol and then it becomes a deterministic protocol. So if, uh, so this tells you the probability, uh, in other words, that rj is bad for x comma y. So you would expect uh, that for a fixed xy, an epsilon fraction of these ris are bad. Yeah, that's because we've assumed we started with the epsilon error protocol to begin with. And now let's assume equality here, just for convenience. It uh, only helps us prove our bounds. And now what we're going to show is that uh, this random variable here actually concentrates around it ex its expectation. As you can expect, we'll use uh, a churn off bound, a multiplicative churn off bound. So Newman's proof uses an additive version of churn off bound. And somehow magically, when you use this multiplicative variant, uh, we're able to get this nice tightness results for equality. So uh, yeah, maybe it's a lesson, like use the correct churn of Yeah, okay. Um, so the, now you get that the probability, um, of, this is still for a fixed x, y, probability that um, greater than an epsilon times one plus delta fraction of random strings are bad is at most two to the minus two n, and then you do a union bound over all x, y. Um, and then this gives you a private coin protocol. Alice samples J from one to B uniformly at random, sends J to Bob. So this takes log B communication complexity. And for us, B is, uh, it should be six N over Delta square epsilon. And then Alice and Bob perform the public coin protocol, assuming RJ was the public random string. And then from this guarantee here, uh, we know that this protocol has error at most epsilon times one plus Delta. I rushed over it. I'm happy to talk about it offline if yeah, you didn't follow. Uh, so the cost of this protocol is uh, the cost here, which is log, which is the public coin communication complexity, the cost here, which is log B. Uh, and this is what we get eventually, uh, the upper bound. Applied to equality, this gives us near tight upper bounds for equality. This is an epsilon square over here. Um, so this log log one over epsilon is a slightly annoying factor. So it remains open whether this can be removed or not. Uh, but unfortunately it so happens in certain regimes when epsilon is extremely small, this, this is actually necessary here. So it's not clear how to get rid of this in a uniform fashion for all epsilon. We also get tight bounds for uh, the quantum communication complexity. Uh, also in this other model where you send pure states only in one way. And the proof techniques here go in a very similar fashion here. Uh, you just have to know like what are possible messages that Alice can send Bob. Uh, and then you choose these messages somehow randomly from uh, a certain space ra rather than choosing your randomness randomly. And then uh, you apply concentration bounds in a similar, that are of similar flavors to the multiplicative churn of bound that I said, and a very high level. Um, and using this, we actually obtain uh, improved ranks, upper bounds on approximate rank and related variants for the identity function, uh, which uh, nearly match uh, Alon's lower bounds. And uh, this in turn gives us uh, improved upper bounds for the sync of XOR function, which was used a few years ago to refute these randomized and quantum variants of the log rank conjecture. Um, yeah, and that's thanks for your attention. Thank you.
So mm-hmm. is there any known reduction going the other way in the sense that suppose you get really, really tight uh, bounds for just equality. Mm-hmm. Does that allow you to strengthen Newman's theorem for arbitrary functions F? I mean, right now, I think you, you strengthen Newman's theorem and as a corollary, you get a bound for equality. That's correct. So um, is there anything that goes the other way? I mean, uh, not that I know of. I uh, I know that there's been some work on showing that Newman's theorem is tight. Now I'm not sure what regime this is in and like where the constants matter and so on. Uh, no. I'm not sure about this other direction reduction. Any more questions? No? Okay. In that case, let's thank Nikhil once again. It's on the back. No, no, not this one. Not this one. It was copied the function. It should be on the yeah, it's on the desktop. Yeah, that that. Control one. Move, move some of the controls out of the way. How did we go again? Go back to the top. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 hide, hide, hide. Okay, then. Can you click on this one? Go back on this one. The type is there. And move the cursor. Sorry, it's very tiny there. Can you move the cursor away? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so we're ready to, we're almost ready. Give us. Yeah, okay. So the next talk is going to be given by Dinesh Krishnamurti and he'll tell us about bounded simultaneous messages. Just oh, oh, okay. Yeah, so you can see, see it. Oh, okay. Thanks, uh, thanks, Meena. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, uh, so this is uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Andre Bogdanov, uh, Yuval Filmus, uh, Yuval Ishai, Avi Kaplan, and Shruti Shekhar. Okay, so uh, so let's uh, get started. Um, we'll uh, talk about first uh, what is a simultaneous messages model. So uh, as uh, we have seen in some of the previous sessions, it's uh, you again have uh, two parties, Alice and Bob, except uh, now that they don't talk to each other, there is some fight. So you have a, a third party, okay. huh. third party uh, called Carol, uh, uh, who is who's going to help do the computation. So the setup is, is similar. So, uh, uh, and uh, so Alice gets, uh, x so there is a function that you have to compute and let's not worry about their lengths for now okay so uh, alice gets uh, input x bob gets input y and uh, alice and bob uh, based on their input compute something and uh, and send that whatever that they have computed to uh, carol and carol in turn computes a function okay that's it there is no more communication between them just one shot Simultaneously, they send the message and it's done. Okay, and all the parties involved are uh, computationally unbounded. Okay, Alice, Bob, Carol, all are computationally unbounded. They can solve halting problem even as Nikhil suggested. So, um, uh, yeah. So, oh, okay, okay. I'll try to be here. Yeah, okay. So. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, Carol computes uh, 
uh, as we said, that takes in the messages from Alice and Bob and uh, computes a function. And we want the output to be exactly equal to uh, f of x comma y for all x and y. Okay, that's the requirement. In that say, in that case, you say that uh, this there is a simultaneous uh, messages protocol that computes this function f. Okay, and this is introduced by uh, Uh, this is introduced by Yao, and uh, it is further studied by uh, Babai, Gal, Kimmel, uh, and Tokum. Um, and here, the measure of interest is, uh, since all these entities are computationally bounded, the measure of interest is the length of the messages that, that get sent from Alice to Bob, in sum of length of A of X and B of Y. That's some measure of interest. Okay. Um, Yeah, okay, so the uh, so our model is a following. So we are uh, interested in the uh, following setup, where uh, the same as setup before, but Carol is computationally uh, bounded. Okay, that's the setup, and that's what we are we call as a bounded uh, simultaneous messages uh, model. And uh, the parameters of interest now are two in number. Now, not only are we interested in the message complexity, but we are also interested uh, in the uh, complexity of Carol. Okay, so uh, there are so let's before we get started, let's just look at some quick examples to get familiarized with the model. So uh, let's say that uh, you are given a Boolean function on n bits. As we said, there are two parts to it, x and y. Let's say that x is the first n by two bits, y is the remaining n by two bits, and uh, you would want to uh, and let's say that Carroll is a Boolean circuit. Okay, so the naive sort of approach is you. Uh, Alice and Bob just sends the message as it is without any computation. And Carol computes a Boolean function on 2 power n bits that can be computed by a circuit of size 2 power n. Okay, And uh, so that tells you that there is, a, uh, there is a protocol. So we call this, we abbreviate it as BB, BSM, the bounded simultaneous messages. So there is a BSM protocol of, uh, of with Carol's complexity 2 power n and uh, message length n. Okay. Uh, can we do better? This is not an interesting example. Let's consider a setting where you can, so yeah, uh, Carol just is a brute force circuit and Alice and Bob sends the input. So uh, you can do slightly better if you allow uh, Alice and Bob to do some computation. Okay, And remember that Alice and Bob can do whatever they want, but only on their inputs. Okay? So there is a, a protocol that uh, where Carol is of size 2 power n over 2, and uh, the uh, message length is also roughly 2 power n over 2. Yeah, there is some slight saving on the input. So uh, how do you achieve this? Again, uh, let, let's just go back to, if you recall uh, uh, the talk given by Swagato uh, yesterday, where he said that uh, any Boolean function corresponding to any Boolean function, you can write down a real polynomial, okay, real multilinear polynomial, in fact, a unique multilinear real polynomial computing the function. So uh, if you carefully look at uh, uh, follow the argument, you will see that the coefficients are not, not necessarily real. They are actually integer values. So what you can do is you can just take, uh, and since they compute uh, a Boolean value, you can actually go modulo 2 on both sides. Okay. So, so you can actually say, you can say that any Boolean function can be computed by a, a polynomial where uh, the coefficients are 0 and 1. And what you have to do is you have to take, instead of real addition over reals, you just do addition modulo 2. Okay. This is a real, this is a F2 polynomial. Okay. And it looks like this. The terms looks like uh, something like some some coefficient times product of x terms times product of y terms. Okay, that's how it looks like. And this coefficients will be zero or one. So so this gives you given this representation, this gives us a a, a protocol. So uh, the the naive the natural thing to try is you have Alice uh, send all possible uh, products of her input to Carol. Uh, Bob send all possible uh, products of his input uh, to Carol. And uh, what Carol does is just a parity of ands. Like it'll take and of the whichever coefficient CST is non zero, it'll appropriately pick those terms, take the and, and take a parity, be a huge parity, parity of potentially 2 power n over 2 terms. So, um, so that gives you a Carol of size uh, 2 power n over 2, and uh, a message, and message is roughly uh, 2 power n over 2 again. Okay. So, so I hope. This is we have warmed up on an example uh, of for for a for a non trivial example. So uh, so it turns out that this is not very far from uh, uh, this is somewhat the best that you could hope. 
So in fact, by a counting argument, you can show that uh, there are Boolean functions on n bits, where again, the task is first n by two, second n by two forms the x and y. In, in that case, there are uh, Boolean functions where you need uh, Carol to be of size uh, at least two power n over two. Okay, so the uh, question is, uh, can you find uh, an explicit function for which you, you need two power n over two? Uh, which is, this is actually a much, much harder question. You are not only giving a, we do not, we do not know how to answer uh, the same question even without this Alice and Bob. Okay, so forget now you're giving more power to the uh, adversary, so to the to the circuit, so uh, it's going to only make our life harder. Nevertheless, there are some uh, results along this direction where um, you do have uh, some lower bounds, not exponential, but uh, but you do have some lower bounds. So uh, so in the case where uh, the circuit is a death three uh, death three circuit of uh, unbounded fan and and or not, uh, you do have some near cubic lower bound, and you do have some uh, almost quadratic lower bounds if uh, the underlying circuit structure is is a formula. The circuit the circuit is usually a directed acyclic graph. Now it's a tree. Okay, and you are allowed to use arbitrary uh, gates. So these, uh, so these results, both of these are for the inner product function, the Boolean inner product function. And uh, there is also this uh, framework of uh, graph complexity, which also attempts to answer questions in this flavor, where you have this arbitrary, uh, yeah. So let me just leave it there. And uh, there are there is also a couple of connections to uh, cryptography. The the reason why one would there are potential settings where we would want the Carol to be computationally efficient. I will probably not go in that direction. Instead, I'll try and explain uh, a bit about the instance hiding connection. Okay, so right. So so our focus uh, in this work is uh, is to understand the BSM complexity of certain natural uh, class of uh, functions where in the settings where Carol is is a Boolean circuit, arithmetic circuit, and low degree polynomials. Okay, so this is roughly what we uh, we were trying to uh, uh, focus on. So we'll get started with the setting where Carol is uh, Boolean circuit. Uh, again, as Nikhil pointed out, so we should probably start with uh, some of the hard problems in NP and try to show circuit lower bounds. So the the one that the hardest problem that you can think of is a complete problem in NP, which is SAT. Okay. So the question that you would uh, want to ask is: Is it true that uh, that SAT has efficient BSM protocols? Okay. Again, just to uh, clarify what I did not talk in quant quantitatively about these numbers. So by efficient, what we mean is uh, the size of Carol is polynomial in its input, and uh, the message output by Alice and Bob is polynomial in their input. Okay. It's some polynomially related connection. So that's what we call as efficient. We consider as efficient. And uh, one could also rephrase this as a following. So suppose you have a Boolean circuit, which is trying to solve the satisfiability problem. Uh, would a bit of pre-processing, uh, unbounded, computationally unbounded pre-processing help the circuit? Okay, so that's what we mean by this pre-processing. Does pre-processing help uh, SAT? Okay. Um, uh, again, uh, one one small issue is that whenever we talk about uh, this uh, BSM protocols or uh, simultaneous messages protocol, you should have two parts to the input. Okay. And uh, again, we do not know how to argue anything unconditionally about uh, almost anything unconditionally about SAT. So uh, so the first, so let's address each of them. The first issue is you think of a very natural uh, uh, variant of SAT, which we call a split SAT, where it consists of alpha and beta, where uh, alpha and beta are CNF instances, and alpha and beta, the Boolean formula alpha and beta is satisfiable. Okay, And to address the second issue, well, that's that comes to telling the result. So we don't have a unconditional result. We just have a following conditional statement uh, what it says is, if the split SAT has efficient BSM protocols, then every language in NP can be computed by a better than brute force circuit. Okay, so a brute force circuit would be like input length n, it will be like 2 power n. We can do in slightly better, like 2 power n over 2. Okay, so, uh, so stated in contrapositive, what it says is, if there is a language in NP for which uh, you do not, uh, you you like for instance the there is no uh, the the best that you can do is brute force, then uh, brute force meaning best that you can do is larger than two power n over two, then uh, split SAT has no efficient BSM protocols. Okay, the contrapositive that's what 
means. So uh, again, this is the statement is almost useless, uh, and in in the sense that we do not know how to argue the other part. But uh, we do give some evidence. There are some languages which we believe uh, do not have uh, uh, Boolean circuits of size uh, of O tilde of two to the n over two. So we'll not get into this. But instead, we'll just tell this implication proof of this implication statement. It's not very hard. So the idea is the following. So suppose you have a split SAT uh, protocol with you. Uh, we are going to uh, show that a, given any language in NP, there is a slightly better circuit that computes the uh, that decides the uh, uh, that computes the language. Okay. So um, uh, so you take a language in NP. You can uh, you can construct a formula phi uh, from the Kuklev uh, reduction such that uh, the string x y is an L. If there exists a polynomial size certificate z such that phi x y z is Okay, and it's an if and only if implication, and the length of x and length of y is n by two. Okay. Now, what you do is you your aim is you have to construct two formulas alpha and beta such that uh, this alpha and beta is and give alpha to uh, Alice, uh, beta to Bob, and there is this BSM protocol that anyway computes the split set. Okay. So the alpha and beta that you come up with is the following: so alpha x of u v z, where u v z are the variables, and x is known to us. Okay, so you encode the following formula: u equal to x, which is essentially u one equal to x one, and u two equal to x two, and and so on up to u n by two equal to x n by two, and phi x v z, and beta y is analogous one, same for the y. I mean u v z is v equal to y, and phi uh, phi u y z. Okay, and what you do is you just uh, simulate Carroll on alpha x and beta y, like the BSM, the, the top part. Okay. So the uh, correctness again is, is, is almost immediate. So if alpha x and beta y is true, then you will see since alpha x is true, you will see that uh, phi, uh, there is some v such that uh, phi x v z is, is true. And uh, beta y is true would enforce that v to be y. Okay, it's just, uh, uh, just by the construction. And uh, the co that's a forward direction. The reverse direction is phi x y z is true. Then you just plug in u to be x and v to be y, and that will satisfy both alpha x and beta. And whatever that we have explained so far can actually be encoded as a encoded as a Boolean circuit of size two to the n over two. Like for each x, since length of x is n over two, you can encode this this alpha x, generate this alpha x, simulate the circuit, and all of this can be done with this poly n times two power n over. Okay, that's the that completes this argument. So now let's move on to the setting where, uh, in a slightly arithmetic setting. So Nikhil was uh, uh, talking about the, the Nikhil was talking about uh, um, the arithmetic uh, variance of the problem. So let's consider the setting where uh, uh, the Carroll is an arithmetic circuit. Okay, where you have uh, operations uh, multiply and divide, and you're over the uh, reals. And uh, you would want to ask, so there's this fundamental problem of matrix multiplication. You're given two n cross n matrices, and you would want to compute the product of the matrices. So the natural question that we are asking over here is, is there any help if you have an algebraic Alice and algebraic, the output some polynomials, Alice and Bob output some polynomials, and can that help in computing the uh, product, the matrix multiplication product? So what we show is, uh, unfortunately, uh, no. I mean, uh, any arithmetic uh, BSM protocol that Computes n cross n uh, matrix multiplication product must have must have a Carroll the Carroll size must be at least n to the omega. Okay, yeah. Carroll must do at least n to the omega uh, operations. So the uh, idea is is, is, is not is, is the following. So the the first mind block is you will have Alice and Bob compute arbitrary polynomials, but uh, what you can observe min minutes thought would tell you that uh, that only the constants and the linear terms in this in the outputs of Alice or in Bob is only going to matter because at the end, uh, if you think of the matrix multiplication as a polynomial, it'll, it's a homogeneous degree two polynomial. So only the only these terms matter. And what you can show is uh, you can look at the, uh, you can observe that uh, this structure tells you an upper bound on the tensor rank of the matrix n cross n matrix multiplication tensor. And you do know lower bounds for uh, the tensor rank is like n to the omega for large enough m. And that's, that's all what we uh, do here. So, uh, so moving on, you so this is the arithmetic setting. Moving on to this uh, next setting, which is on the setting where Carroll is a low-degree polynomial. 
So, uh, so the, now replace Carol by a polynomial instead. And uh, what we can, so for instance, if you think of the, and the, pol and the polynomial that we're talking about is, is over F2. Okay. So the coefficients are, the addition is modulo 2, and the coefficients are 0 or 1. And we know that every function can be expressed in this form, as we have said initially. Okay. So, um, uh, and it is easy to look at, construct functions for which uh, the F2 degree of the function is like n. For instance, imagine the AND function. Okay, the AND function, you can argue that the F2 degree is at least n. But if you think of designing a BSM protocol for this uh, simultaneous messages protocol for this function, then you could have, you could give the first n by 2 bits to Alice, the second n by 2 bits to Bob. Alice can compute the AND of those bits. Bob can compute the AND of those bits and just send it to Carol. Now, Carol can just do an AND of those two bits, which can be encoded as just x1, x2. Okay, so that's a degree 2 polynomial. So pre-processing can help. Okay. So the uh, uh, so the what we ask is can help in certain settings. What we ask is is it uh, how much can it help? Okay. So what we end up uh, so, so imagine that you have uh, a budget of m bits of communication that Alice and Bob can send to Carol, and you want to compute uh, an arbitrary n bit boolean function. How much saving can you? How much better than n can you do in terms of degree for for the Carol? Okay. So what we uh, what we argue is. Uh, you can can do slightly better. You can uh, can show that uh, uh, any function can be computed in uh, something like uh, n over log m over n. Okay, so uh, there are some savings. Um, again, the idea is similar to what we saw in the first uh, example, uh, the the example one, not example zero, example one uh, about uh, constructing a non-trivial BSM protocol. The idea is you just divide uh, the inputs into blocks of size something roughly log m over n and send all possible and values and uh, have Carol compute uh, the polynomial. Let the uh, you can do the computation. Okay, so so let let's so and uh, so this in fact generalizes an argument due to uh, Beaver, uh, uh, Feynman, Killian, and uh, Rogoway. So so what we also and this argument works for any uh, any works for real polynomials, whichever uh, that whichever representation you would, you would want to uh, have. And uh, we have an almost matching lower bound um, of m uh, omega of n over log m. Uh, this works for F2, okay, when the polynomial is over F2. Okay, so um, so let's, uh, so, so I promise that I will talk about uh, a bit of connection to instance hiding. So this was one of the motivation why we uh, started looking at this. So let's, so let's just uh, understand this setting. So we are just change of uh, setup. Okay, if you did not understand, you can, something new so um, so imagine that you have a boolean function f okay now there are no two parts just a single part and uh, now you have a slightly different actor called henry and you have two oracles alice and bob okay and um, uh, henry gets an and imagine that henry is uh, computationally bounded okay you can for practical purpose think of it as a, a polynomial size circuit okay and uh, henry gets this x and uh, henry wants to compute f of x so to do that, uh, Henry takes the help of this oracle. Again, Henry will send some message to oracle, and the oracle will respond back with give some response. And based on that, uh, uh, Henry could compute. Okay. Again, as usual, Alice and Bob are computationally unbounded. So, um, so what's the big deal about uh, why is this interesting? You can just compute. Ask Henry can just ask Alice to compute f of x. Just send x to uh, Alice and do the computation. So that's where the catch comes. So um, the catch is you, the both the uh, Alice and Bob, uh, the communication should be done in such a way that the Alice and Bob does not learn anything about the input. Okay, Alice and Bob cannot learn anything about what is x. It can possibly learn its length, nothing more than that. Okay, so um, so that's the privacy requirement. Correctness requirement is it should complete correctly compute f uh, correctly compute f of x for all x. Uh, so let's just look at a very toy example. Okay, so just to get uh, understand this model uh, clearly. So um, it's very toy, very much of a toy model. So uh, so consider the following task where you are given an n bit string and you want to compute the parity of all the bits. Okay, imagine for a moment that Hen Henry is computationally very restricted that it can only compute parity of two bits but not parity of n bits. Okay, imagine this artificial situation. But uh, Alice and Bob uh, can compute parity of n bits. Okay. Now we want to compute uh, 
parity of n bits without telling what are the bit what are the contents of the bit okay so here is one strategy to uh, uh, do this so what alice uh, what henry does is henry has access to some randomness okay private randomness so henry picks a random string uh, random n bit string and asks alice for f of r and uh, Henry computes X parity R, which is just does the bitwise XOR, XOR of X and R. Okay, that is what is denoted by this X parity R. And uh, asks Bob for F of X parity R. And, uh, and based on the answers, they, uh, Henry just computes F of X. Okay? So uh, correctness is, is immediate. Uh, these extra parity bits gets removed because all you have to do is if Alice gets an answer A, Bob gets an answer B, you just output A parity B. So the extra parity bits get removed when you take the overall parity. Okay, so and what you get is the parity of bits in uh, X. Okay, and uh, uh, privacy is guaranteed uh, because if you look at the set of messages that are sent to Alice, uh, it is completely random. And uh, set of messages that are sent to Bob are a shift of a random string, which in turn is also random. Okay, so that uh, hopefully it makes uh, instance hiding setup clear. So, uh, so, uh, yeah. So, what is interesting about uh, uh, this this setting? So, it is uh, so Fortno and Segedi uh, studied this. Uh, not exactly this setup, but uh, 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 their result actually implies the following: If SAT has efficient instance hiding schemes, again, uh, when we say in instance hiding, there is just one round of communication that can happen. No more rounds, just one round. Okay, unlike the communication setting that uh, that we have seen previously. So uh, in in the case where uh, uh, the Henry is let's say polynomially bounded and uh, the oracles Alice and Bob can only respond with just one bit, one bit of answer, then uh, if 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 it turns out that SAT has such an instance hiding scheme, then uh, what uh, Fortno and Segri showed is that uh, the polynomial hierarchy would collapse to third level. Okay, so it tells you some indication that it's unlikely that SAT has. Uh, such instance hiding schemes. Okay, so uh, so the uh, so our result is, is a connection between uh, the BSM setting and instance hiding scheme. So what we show is, in particular, what we show is if S SAT, the split SAT, has an efficient BSM protocol, then uh, for instance, SAT has an uh, efficient instance hiding scheme. Okay, again, the efficiency is in terms of polynomial in the input that we set. Message length is polynomial in the input length. Circuit size is polynomial. Okay, so. Um, Right, so let's just sketch a proof of uh, uh, of this this statement. So uh, uh, so imagine. So what we have is imagine that we have a BSM protocol which is shown by this dotted box that uh, solves the uh, split SAT problem. So now what we want to now our task is the following. So we we somehow give a reduction from three SAT to split SAT. It's not exactly a reduction, but in some sense a reduction. So the task that we have is the following. You have a formula phi. And you would somehow want to come up with some formula alpha, some CNF alpha and some CNF beta, such that uh, P is satisfiable if and only if alpha and beta is satisfiable. And alpha and beta, like if you just if if just alpha is given to you, it doesn't reveal any information about phi. And if you are just given beta, it doesn't reveal any information about phi. Okay. So uh, uh, so the, here is a, a construction. Okay, so uh, so let's let's take all possible uh, three three CNF uh, clauses on n variables, and that's something like eight times n cube, okay, n cube many clauses, um, and you introduce some extra variables y one to y n, where n is this all possible the number eight times n cube, uh, n choose three, and uh, uh, Alice. So, so the uh, you pick a random permutation pi of two n elements. Okay, now we are going to construct alpha and beta. So alpha is simply the following. So you look at all uh, all indices from one to n. So you put all those clauses, okay, ci, and and you and you do a or with y pi of i, okay, where pi is a permutation that we picked at random. And uh, now we are going to define beta, okay. So so let's say that i is a set of all indices uh, corresponding to uh, the clauses that appear in the formula, and j is n plus the Indices of all those clauses that do not appear in the P, in the formula in the instance P. Okay, and beta is defined to be and over all i in indices in i union j negation of y of pi of i. Okay, 
so these are alpha and beta and what we what we let's let's quickly argue that uh, if phi is satisfiable then alpha and beta is satisfiable and if alpha and beta is satisfiable then phi is satisfiable okay so let's argue the first direction so if phi is satisfiable then what does it mean if phi is satisfiable then there must be some setting uh, of indices in so there must be some setting of the variables that would satisfy all the uh, uh, that would satisfy all these cis if all the C cis appearing in i would be set would be set to true and uh, only so the only thing is you would want to somehow come up with some setting of this y pi of i which uh, for all those i's that do not appear in the i okay so what you can do is you can just uh, set them as true that will satisfy this whole formula okay because ci cis are already satisfied because phi is satisfied okay so now that shows that alpha is there is a setting that satisfies alpha now uh, how can you satisfy beta okay uh, so remember you uh, so we have set variables we have set uh, values y of pi i for i not in i okay so for i in i you just set them to false and uh, j these these indices also you set them to false okay so this will always be true okay for this setting of y so given a satisfiable assignment for phi you can get a satisfiable assignment for alpha and beta okay conversely if alpha and beta is satisfiable so uh, beta is satisfiable which means all the indices i uh, which for which the clauses appear in the formula the the variable will appear in the negated form okay so to satisfy this the y pi of i should be set to false in that case all those clauses here must be true because it's an and of all those clauses it becomes false so if alpha is satisfiable all those clauses that appear in the in the set i will become satisfiable because we already know alpha and beta is satisfiable and that shows that phi is satisfiable because phi is nothing but all these clauses okay so so that completes and and yeah for that completes the correctness so the privacy is the following if you look at uh, alpha the all clauses appear and then there is a random order of randomly appearing uh, uh, y set y indices and uh, beta this for alpha and for beta it's the same some random order of uh, y indices are appearing so they look random they don't tell anything about the uh, formula they don't tell anything about phi okay the phi is sort of hidden okay so this uh, so yeah so this is so so this completes the session so so in summary what we have uh, looked at is we looked at bsm complexity uh, of uh, when the when the carol is, is a boolean uh, uh, arithmetic as well as a low degree polynomial computing some some interesting uh, class of functions and uh, we have also introduced so this whatever that we said could be formalized as as a reduction notion of reduction so uh, this which what we call as split hide reductions in the in the paper so there are some, we also explored this and showed some more reductions for some natural np complete languages like uh, partition three coloring so there are also you can look at the paper for more details and uh, so we also looked at special class of boolean functions and uh, showed that you could design bsm protocols for them okay so it's appear in the full version so um, so that's pretty much the summary and and in terms of open problems so uh, one question that we really really wanted to answer was uh, what can you say in the in the setting where you want to do matrix multiplication can you have what happens if carol is a boolean circuit okay can you can you say something and um, and whatever that we have said so far is only about the size uh, we did not look at the depth okay so what what can you say there okay so these are a couple of questions and uh, thank you any questions so is there anything you can say for something simpler like polynomial multiplication with preprocessing uh, in the sense that without preprocessing we can do it in n log n time but is there preprocessing that allows us to do it faster uh, i haven't thought about it i i don't have an answer currently but okay. but yeah thanks good question any other questions i have a very generic question you you call this pre processing but it is pre processing with a computationally unbounded agent right. so in some sense it is similar to advice but advice is re restricted by in input length right, right. so this this is something like instance specific advice or borrowing from the 
free lunch talk, you know, targeted advice. So I don't know, are, is, is there other literature about such instance specific advice? In, I... Not necessarily in the communication setting. So, but... Okay. I am not aware of such a connection, but uh, but you're saying it's... Uh, no, I don't even know whether no, it is there. Uh, yeah, I am not aware also, of this. I also don't know if it's... But yeah, it's not... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No? Thanks, Srinesh. Um, Does it make sense to look at like non-deterministic or randomized versions of this BSM? Uh, it's... it's Yeah, we did not consider it, but I think the uh, whatever the... People who studied this was Babai uh, Kimmel Lokam. So they did look at randomized variants on the uh, message with, with the message complexity as the uh, main uh, interest. Yeah. They did look at it. Yeah, we did not. Yeah, I, it's interesting. It's indeed interesting to look at it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So let's thank uh, the nation once again. Thanks. That brings us to the end of this session. And since the session was about communication complexity, I hope there are no lower upper bounds on communication during the break. We can talk as much as we want. Just an announcement, a minute. Yeah, so uh, if you're continuing to attend the Spectral Methods workshop tomorrow, please keep the pouch as it were, we'll only give you a card. So the new, the new name tag for the Spectral Methods. So if there is an intersection, we don't want to, re, uh, I mean, we want to reuse the pouch. We want to reuse the pouch as much as possible.
Okay, hi, uh, welcome back and welcome to the very last session of this year's FCTCS. We have two talks lined up, uh, will be given by Jatin and Akanksha and Jatin will go first. So what to you, Jatin? Yeah, so uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Jatin uh, from IIT Delhi uh, and uh, I'll be presenting uh, an optimal algorithm for sorting in trees. And this is joint work with Jishnu uh, from uh, Princeton University. Okay, so uh, usually sorting is applied in uh, total orders. Uh, and in the comparison based sorting model, uh, you get to ask queries of the form given to elements, which one appears before and which one appears after in the total order. And the task is to reconstruct the linear ordering. Uh, but it can be generalized to partial orders, uh, where the input is a hidden uh, input is a set of elements, P. And uh, the partial order is hidden. Uh, but you get an access to an oracle uh, where you can ask queries of the form given to elements x and y. Uh, you will get whether x succeeds y uh, in the relation or not. right? And uh, the task is, of course, to reconstruct the partial order. And the query complexity is equal to the minimum number of queries required to do this. So uh, first of all, it's easy to see that uh, even to figure out whether there exists even one comparable pair, you need to make all the comparisons, right? Uh, so, so there's a very obvious lower bound of or, order n square. Uh, so therefore, in literature, this query complexity has been parameterized with respect to the width of the partial order, uh, which is the size of the maximum empty chain. Uh, and there exists an information theoretic lower bound of uh, Wn plus n log n. And this is simply taking log of the number of partial orders uh, within elements that have width w. Uh, Fagel and Turan in uh, 1988 gave a deterministic algorithm that uses uh, wn log of n by w queries, which is quite close to the optimal. And uh, this was uh, improved to the optimal uh, complexity by the scalar case Karp, Mosel, Reisenfeld, and Verbin in 2007. Uh, however, uh, their time complexity is exponential, which means that even though they are using a polynomial number of queries, in fact, optimal number of queries, uh, they take exponential time in figuring out which queries to ask. Uh, we'll be focusing on trees, which are a special case of partial orders, uh, where uh, for any element x, uh, the set of the elements that uh, succeed that el element uh, is well ordered. Right, and uh, the above definition it naturally corresponds corresponds to the rooted trees in uh, graph theoretic sense, uh, where uh, y succeeds x if and only if y is an ancestor of x, and and it's easy to see that the set of the ancestors of any node form a total order. Okay, so the equivalent problem is uh, rooted tree reconstruction. You have a rooted hidden rooted tree. Uh, you do not know the edges of the tree, but you can ask queries of the form given two vertices u and v. Is u an ancestor of v or not? And the task is to reconstruct the tree. And uh, we're going to study the query complexity of this problem. Again, uh, it's easy to see that n square queries are, in fact, necessary. Because for any pair of vertices u, comma v, if you consider these two trees, uh, t1 and t2, where in t1, the parent of every vertex is n. And in t2, the parent of every vertex is n, except that the parent of v is u. Right? So for any pair of vertices, except u, comma v, the result of the query would be the same, whether it comes from t1 or t2. So therefore, you need to you need to uh, any deterministic algorithm must query every pair explicitly in order to be able to differentiate between 
uh, these kinds of trees. And this can be trivially uh, generalized to randomized algorithms also uh, by using Yao's principle and uh, generating random trees by just choosing u and v randomly, right? Uh, okay. So, but in this in this example, the degree of uh, the maximum degree of a vertex is n minus one, and uh, we are going to restrict uh, the degree, and we are we are going to see if every vertex has at most d children, then can we do better than n square, right? And d equal to one is a special case, uh, which corresponds to uh, sorting a total order because, uh, well, if d equal to one is simply a chain and querying whether u is an ancestor of v is same as querying whether u comes before v or after v, right? Uh, and this, of course, can be done in order and log n. So we're going to see if uh, we can do better for uh, a general d as well. Okay, so uh, these are the previous results. Uh, Jagdish and Sain in 2013 uh, give a deterministic algorithm that uses uh, these many queries, d into n to the 1.5 into log n. Uh, and note that this is not even optimal for d equal to 1, right? Uh, and, and to this state, nothing better in the deterministic domain is known. Uh, so coming to randomized algorithms in 2019, Wang and Honorio gave a randomized algorithm with d into n into log square n queries. And uh, Afsar, Goodrich, Matthias, and Oseguera in 2020 gave uh, an algorithm that uses d square and log inquiries. And very recently, uh, a lower bound of d into n into log at the base dn was proved. And our result is uh, a matching upper bound. Uh, we are going to give a randomized algorithm that takes order d into n into log at the base dn queries. OK, so before we get into the algorithm, uh, I'll discuss some building blocks, uh, some simple uh, algorithms that we use repeatedly. So the first is, suppose you have to find the root of the tree. Uh, to do that, we can just consider any arbitrary ordering v1 through vn. Uh, we can start uh, by setting r to v1, and we can consider all the vertices v2, v3 up to vn in that order. And if uh, uh, vi is an ancestor of r, we jump from vi to r. So it's called an ancestor jumping algorithm. So for example, in here, we'll start at v1. Uh, and we'll jump to v3, then ju we'll jump to v6, but we, want to we won't jump to v2 because v2 is not an ancestor of v1, right? So, so the root must appear somewhere in the ordering, and whenever we reach the root, we must jump to the root because the root is an ancestor of everything. And once we have jumped to the root, we won't jump anywhere else because no one is ancestor of root, right? Uh, and similarly, uh, we can also find the parent of any vertex, given vertex in inquiries. We first find the set of all the ancestors, and then we just apply the ancestor jumping algorithm, but in reverse. Uh, so this is also very, very easy. <clears throat> then, uh, in order d into n queries, we can find the subtrees of all the children of v. So given a node v, uh, suppose we, we need to figure out what are the children of v, we don't know the children, and we need to figure out what are the subtrees of those children. Uh, so to do that, first of all, let's remove v and the nodes that are not in the subtree of v from, the, from our set of nodes, and then we can just start at an arbitrary vertex and then apply the ancestor jumping algorithm, and it's easy to see that we will always end up at one of the children. And once we get a child, we just remove the subtree of that child, uh, and then we recurse on the rest. So every every uh, phase here, every step, every iteration here, it takes order and uh, queries. And there are at most d children, so it will be d into n at most. Okay. So the broad idea is that we are going to be we are going to be choosing some vertex v, and then we are going to be finding all the these subtrees and all the nodes that are not not in the subtree, and then we can consider these as independent. Uh, uh, sub problems. So, so we'll we'll choose some vertex v. We'll find all the subtrees of the children, and we'll find the nodes that are not in the subtree, and we'll also find the parent. All of uh, all of this can be done uh, in order d and uh, time once we have the vertex. Once we have we choose a vertex v. But of course, if we choose a vertex v such that suppose t one has size n minus one, then that is then this is useless because we'll end up with n square algorithm in the end, right? So we we need to find some way to find these uh, not too large sub problem sizes. And uh, so which vertex do we choose? Uh, so we're going to choose the centroid. Uh, and the centroid is a vertex C, such that uh, the subtree, the size of the subtree of C is at least n by 2. And for every child, the subtree size is less than n by 2. So for example, here, if C is the subtree size, C is the centroid, then all the children's subtrees have size uh, less than n by 2. Uh, but uh, but the, <coughs> the, the subtree of C has subtree size, uh, the, uh, has size uh, greater than or equal to n by 2. Uh, so if we remove C, uh, all the remaining, uh, you know, all the remaining sub problems, they have size less than or equal to n by two, right? Uh, so this means that uh, if if we keep on removing such vertices, the depth of our recursion tree will be at most logarithmic, right? Uh, 
So, so now the question is, how do we find this uh, uh, this node, right? This uh, centroid of the tree, and it can be seen that the centroid exists, always exists in a rooted tree, and it is unique because you can just start at the root and you can just keep going to the largest child if it has size greater than n by two, and you can stop otherwise uh, because then it will definitely be the centroid, and this pro this process al also proves the uniqueness of the centroid. Uh, okay, so so now we need to find the centroid. Uh, so this is. So here we'll first see a uh, see an algorithm that uh, omit, uh, that produces uh, a potential centroid, and then we'll prove that it works with with some probability. So we'll choose a random vertex X. Uh, we'll find the set of all its all its ancestors, and we'll sort them. And we can sort them because uh, they form a total order. Uh, so we can sort them in n log in time and log in queries. And then we just return the lowest ancestor, which has subtree size at least n over two, right? Uh, so in this diagram, suppose we had chosen X. Right? Then we return the lowest ancestor of xy that has subtree size at least n over 2. We know that such a such a uh, ancestor will always exist because the root has subtree size equal to n. Uh, so, so then uh, we claim that with probability at least half, the above algorithm returns the centroid. And this is because if x lies in the subtree of the centroid, in that event, uh, the algorithm must output c, uh, the centroid c. Because by definition, C has subtree size at least n by two, but its child, which is the ancestor of X, has subtree size lesser than n by two, right? Uh, and this happens with probability at least half because the subtree size of C is uh, at least n by two. So at least half of the nodes are valid for us. Okay, so if we uh, if we see the query complexity of finding a centroid like this, uh, then uh, sorting takes n log n queries, and then uh, returning the lowest ancestor also take n, lo n log n queries because uh, we just sort uh, we just bind the research on this sorted list right and and every step just computes the subtree size s y and uh, computing the subtree size is basically just iterate over every all the nodes and see if they are a descendant of y or node right so so this takes uh, order n log n queries also because there are on, there are order log n steps and every step takes order n queries. And now this this gives us a centroid with probability half. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll just repeat it un until we get a centroid. So what we'll do is uh, we'll, fi we'll find a potential centroid and we'll test if it is a centroid. And testing whether a, a node y is a centroid can be done easily by just finding all the subtrees of the children and seeing if at least one of those exceeds n by two in size. So this uh, this testing if if a node is a centroid takes order d in queries. Uh, and then if it is the centroid, we can re return it. Otherwise, we go back to the step one, we choose a, another random vertex and we do everything again. And the expected number of iterations is, of course, less than or equal to two. And the expected number of queries is ordered d in plus n log n. And this is the uh, recurrent solution for the query complexity. Uh, if x1, x2 up to xk are the subproblems, then q of n is sum of q of i plus uh, order n log n plus dn, which is the time required to find the centroid. And then uh, dn also uh, contains, uh, also, uh, you know, has has the time required to find all the subproblems, right? So this will be order n log square n plus dn log n because there are log n levels in the recursion tree, and every level contributes n log n plus dn. Uh, so now we we want to improve this. So first of all, note that even this is already better than the previous results, uh, but we want to improve this to dn into log at the base dn. So first of all, we have to get rid of the n log square n term. So how do we get rid of the n log square n term? Uh, so if you look here, uh, in, in my potential centroid finding algorithm, uh, what we are doing is, number one, we are sorting. And we, we have to avoid the sorting part, which we'll come to later. But number two, we are, we are finding the subtree sizes of log n of the nodes in the binary search. Uh, but the idea simply is that instead of finding the exact subtree size, I'll find an estimated subtree size using sampling. And then we'll prove that even that process returns uh, good enough, uh, something close to the centroid, which is still a good enough separator. OK, so what we'll do is we'll simply ra randomly sub sub sample a subset V of the vertices, where every every vertex is added to V with probability 1 or log n. So now, if, uh, so now we'll say that suppose f tilde u is the number of vertices from V that are in the subtree of uh, u. And then the estimated subtree size will be defined as f tilde u into log n. Uh, and it is easy to see that the estimated, the expected value of the estimated subtree size is the same as the subtree size. And computing this estimated subtree size takes n over log n uh, queries now instead of n queries because we just iterate over all the vertices in V and we check if they are uh, descendants of U, U or not. Uh, and this, again, this S tilde is monotonic because uh, the number of sampled nodes that lie in, uh, in, in our text X is less than or equal to the number of sample nodes that lie in one of its ancestors y, right? So for any x and y, says that y is an ancestor of x, s tilde of y is at least equal to s tilde of x. So we can again bind the research. 
right? So our updated algorithm for finding a potential centroid becomes this. We choose a random vertex x. Uh, we find its set of ancestors and sort them. It takes n log queries, but uh, we'll fix this step later. But for now, uh, we'll focus on the second step, which is simply that we'll return the lowest ancestor y, for which this estimated subtree size is at least n over 2 minus log n. This minus log n is just to make the math work out. It's not very important. And But now, it's easy, it's easy to see that there are still log n steps, but every step is n over log n queries, so it's order n queries. Right? And so this is the main lemma of the paper, which proves that this, uh, <coughs> this, pro uh, this process still gives something uh, close to the centroid, which we call a pseudo-centroid. Uh, with probability at least one over eight. And a pseudo centroid is a vertex such that the subtree size uh, of this vertex is at least n over four, but for any of the children, the subtree size is at most n over two. So, so the only difference between the definition of a centroid and a pseudo centroid is that uh, the subtree size earlier was at least n by two. Here, the subtree size is at least n by four. For the children, the definition has not changed. It's still n by two. So, <clears throat> So yeah, so we, we get a pseudo centroid with a high probability. That's uh, that's what we are going to use. But we also need to fix the uh, n log n sorting uh, uh, queries that we, we use. Uh, for this, we, again, we'll use the idea of sampling. Instead of uh, instead of binary searching on the whole set of ancestors, but first we'll just sample a subset of the ancestors uh, where we will add every ancestor to the set with probability one or log n. And then uh, if z1 through zm is the sorted list of ancestors, Amongst this list of ancestors, I'll, this list of sampled ancestors, I'll first find which ancestor is the lowest that has subtree size at least, estimated subtree size at least, and by 2 minus log n. And then within uh, this sampled ancestor and, and its previous sampled ancestor, I'll find the exact position. So we will we do this binary search in two phases instead of just directly uh, sorting and log n, then binary searching. So, so yeah, here's a, here's a diagram which depicts the same. X is the random node that we have chosen. Z1 through Zm are the sampled ancestors that we have chosen. And suppose zi was the lowest ancestor that has subtree size, estimated subtree size at least equal to n by 2 minus log n. Uh, then we'll be in the in the first phase, we, we find this zi minus 1 and zi. And in the second phase, we find the exact position of uh, my estimated centroid within zi minus 1 and zi. And there will be expected log n vertices between these two vertices. So we can again just compute all the estimated subtree sizes for all these vertices. OK, so now uh, we have got rid of the extra n log n factor in my uh, overhead. So I'll, so the time complexity will be dn into log, log n. Uh, and now the only thing that's remaining is to get an extra d uh, in the uh, base of the log. So let's, let's so this d n time, it, it's contributed basically by the routine that, uh, that we use to find the set of uh, descendants uh, and a set of uh, children and all of their subtrees, right? So, so if you look at that again, uh, what we are doing is, uh, we, we just uh, if we need to find the children and their subtrees of a vertex V, uh, we first uh, we keep on randomly choosing a, ver a vertex, and then we find the child whose subtree contains that vertex, and then we remove that subtree. But if we are choosing this vertex X at random again and again, it it may it it's probable that the bigger subtrees will be eliminated before the smaller subtrees. So they won't they won't be contributing to the uh, queries asked after they have been deleted, right? So to formalize this, if we have two uh, downward subproblems, ti and tj, right, uh, then the expected number of queries one asks in which one vertex belongs to ti and the other belongs to tj is the probability that ti is discovered before tj into tj. Because in, the, in this case, suppose uh, this ti was discovered before tj, then all of the uh, vertices inside tj will be queried against this. And similarly, if tj is discovered before ti, then it's ti, right? And this is uh, 2 times ti tj by ti plus tj, which is less than or equal to min of those two. Right. So if the subproblem sizes were x1 greater than or equal to x2 goes on up to xk, then the recursion overhead is order n plus order n for, for finding this uh, upward subproblem. And then for the downward subproblem, it is sum of uh, i xi because any subproblem xi is, is the min for only the first i subtrees. Right. So, so this, this, the, if we sum this min of ti, tj or all i, j, we'll get sum of i xi. And now the modified recursion is this, q of n is equal to q of xi plus summation i xi, where xi are in the decreasing order. And all of the xi are at most 3n by 4, because if you remember the definition of a pseudocentroid, uh, every, uh, this pseudocentroid has subtree size at least n by 4. So the remaining uh, problem, the upward subproblem would have size at most uh, 3n by 4, and all the children have size at most n by 2. So all these sizes are at most 3n by 4. Still, uh, the recursion tree has depth uh, log, uh, log n. Uh, but now we need to uh, 
now we need to find the contribution of this summation i x i term uh, more smarter than what we did before. Uh, so this O n term will clearly contribute order n log n only uh, because there are log n levels. Every level will contribute uh, order n, and this uh, this so we need to only focus on this summation i x i term. Okay, so so if we look at the recursion tree of this uh, this recursion, okay. Uh, for every so for every problem, if the so so consider some uh, some problem whose sub problem size is x one x two goes on through x k. So instead of adding uh, i x i for that sub problem, what I'll do is that in the sub tree uh, of corresponding to the largest sub problem, I'll add I'll charge one to every node. So this is equivalent to adding x i. In the sub tree corresponding to the second largest uh, child, uh, I'll I'll add, I'll charge two to every node on, in on, in that sub tree. And similarly for the smallest uh, smallest child. Uh, I'll charge k to every node in that subtree. So, it, so this will be eventually the same as adding summation i x i if we add up the charges of all the nodes in the end, right? So now we'll simply focus on what the charge of a particular uh, node in the tree is. And uh, so, if we, if we consider a node q in the recursion tree, and suppose uh, the set of ancestors was p one up to p m, and note that this is a recursion tree, so m will be at most logarithmic in n. Uh, and suppose uh, q was the r one th largest child of P1 and P1 was the R2th largest child of uh, P2 and goes on like that. Uh, then the subtree size of P1 is at least R1 times the subtree size of uh, Q. And similarly, the subtree size of P2 is at least uh, R2 times the subtree size of P1 and goes on like that. So the product of all of these ranks must be at least at, at most n, right? And uh, therefore, the sum uh, must be at most uh, d into log at the base dn. Uh, and the sum sum is what uh, so the sum of all these ranks is exactly the charge accumulated on uh, the node Q. Right, because by definition, uh, every node in the recursion tree uh, uh, charges i to uh, to all the nodes in the subtree of its ith largest child. Right, so by definition, the the sum of the charges uh, accumulated at q will be summation r i, and since the product is at most n, and the sum will be maximized when as many of these values are equal to uh, d plus one as possible. So remember that uh, the number of children of a particular node here is at most d plus one. Because when we remove a node uh, in, in a subproblem, that the remaining number of uh, subproblems is at most d plus one, right? One upward subproblems and d downward subproblems. So, so to maximize the sum, given the product is at uh, is at most n, uh, we we must have as many values equal to d plus one as possible, and this will be and the number of such values can of course be at most log log at the base d n. So the total uh, charge on any node, in fact, is uh, order d d into log at the base d n, and to, therefore the total uh, query complexity is. Uh, at most n into d into log with the base dn. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, questions? Anyway. So uh, the next slide is just open problems. Uh, I can move to that if there are no questions. How, how much time do I have left? Okay, yeah. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'll move to open, open problems. Uh, so here we resolve the randomized query complexity of sorting entries, which is d into n into log with the base dn. It is still open, but the deterministic query complexity is uh, the known bounds are d into n to the 1.5 log n and d a n log at the base n lower bound. There is no better lower bound known compared to randomized. And another open problem is whether there exists a polynomial time algorithm that sorts a, par sorts a partial order in this optimal number of queries. Remember that uh, the algorithm of uh, thus Kalakis and others uh, used uh, exponential time in figuring out these optimal number of queries. Right. So this is another open problem. Uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, please ask. Okay, I have a questions, comments, criticism. Yep. Could you please raise your hand again? Yeah. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, I just had one small question. So this uh, really seems like an interesting idea of. Uh, when you're improving the uh, binary search part where you're doing some samplings and then between the two bounds, you're doing some sense. So if one sort of takes that out of the current context, does that give us any better bounds for the actual uh, search itself or does that not translate at all? Uh, sorry, can you please repeat? Yeah, so I'm saying in this binary search, Okay. So if, if I were to apply this kind of a sampling strategy to normal binary research, would it work at all? Or is that too naive of a, yeah. No, it, it does not work. Right. So where exactly? 
uh because because suppose suppose you were dividing into these many steps right suppose you were dividing into root n root n nodes and then you were again binary searching on the middle number of nodes right it will be log of root n plus log of root n which is log of n oh okay okay i see yeah so this even so this, here you have much more room in some sense in the original thing was too yes. bad in, in in the first place for you to be able yes to. so so here we are not avoiding we are not saving anything with respect to binary search we are just we are just saving the n log and sorting over it so instead of sorting all the nodes we are just sorting the sample that's the only thing that we are avoiding hmm okay so, so, okay, so the, okay i got it yeah yeah so the cost saved is not in the binary search right right, right. okay yeah. any Thank more you. questions no more questions uh maybe i have a question so does it make sense to replace a tree with other graph classes for example let's say coral graphs i have not thought about okay. it but maybe yes sure we'll begin right. okay now yeah. let's thank the speaker again Okay, so the last talk will be given by Akanksha on kernelization, and over to Akanksha. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so thank you for staying till the last talk. I'll be speaking about uh, approximately interpolating between uniformly and non-uniformly polynomial kernels, and this is a joint work with M. S. Ramanujan. So let us begin by understanding a few terms from the title. But before that, let me gently introduce what parameterized problems are. You have already seen too many FPT talks, so this is just a refresher. So pick your favorite classical problem, attach an integer with each of the instances of your problem meaningfully, not a, some arbitrary integers, and now you get your parameterized problem. So these integers can be uh, some measure of how complicated your instances how uh, or a measure of certain property of the input output or their combination some typical examples are in the classical setting the input size or say the solution size if you have a graph problem how tree like your graph is or certain measure of distinctness say your input is some set of numbers okay so next let us understand what kernelization is so fix uh, consider a parameterized problem q and now your goal is not to solve this problem q but you want to reduce its size so the algorithm takes as input an instance i comma k of the problem and returns another instance i prime k prime of the same problem so what we demand from the algorithm is that it should run in polynomial time the size of the new instance it cannot be large okay so if we want the size of this new instance to be bounded by some polynomial uh, some function of the parameter here is a g of k where g is some computable function and we want the two instances to be equivalent instances of the problem they cannot be you cannot be outputting any arbitrary instance okay 
So this is what a kernelization is. And based on what this function g is, if it is a polynomial function, then you call the resulting kernelization algorithm as a polynomial kernel. If it's a linear function, then it's a linear kernel and so on. So we'll understand two graph um, measures, uh, measures of how complicated our graphs are, starting with tree depth. You have already seen the definition of tree depth uh, in, the first, uh, in the first talk, but I'll first introduce an alternate way to see what tree depth of a graph is. So consider a graph G, and let us play the following game in the graph. You pick a vertex from the graph and delete it. Here we are deleting this vertex V01. That's our first vertex uh, we deleted. Say it's in level zero. This will be the root of our game that we are playing on the graph. Now, if you remove this vertex from the graph, the graph possibly splits into a bunch of connected components. In this example, it splits into three connected components, C1, C2, and C3. Maybe it just has one component, that's okay but possibly it has multiple components after you remove this vertex. And now you keep playing this game on the connected components. So you choose one one vertex from each of these connected components. Say you chose this vertex V11, V12, and V13 from these three connected components respectively. We denote these vertices from uh, the respective connected components. And so this will be your uh, first, uh, so we started from the zeroth level. This will be your level one, okay? And you keep doing this process till your connected component has no vertex. Uh, it just uh, you're just left with single vertex. In which case, if we delete it, you can no longer proceed, okay? So this gives you a natural tree-like structure in your graph, starting from the root. You add the edges of the vertex that you chose at level zero to the vertex that you chose next which was V11, V12, and V13 respectively. Uh, and similarly, from V11 to the vertices you chose next, and so on and so forth, okay? So, and what is the tree depth of this game, okay? So, uh, let's we'll talk about tree depth in a minute, in a few seconds. So, here you got a tree-like structure in this form. And the depth of this elimination tree that you got from playing this game on the graph is same as the depth of the tree that you got, okay? And the tree depth is the best such depth that you can achieve by playing this game on a graph. So note that based on the choice of the vertices, you can get different trees and you would like to find a deletion in a particular order so that you minimize the height of this tree. The minimum such height is called as the tree depth. Okay, an alternate way to view this is what you saw in the first talk, which is uh, fix your graph and what you want to, and fix also a tree. You want to map the vertices of the graph to the vertices of, uh, of the tree in a bijective way so that if you look at any, D, uh, any edge in your original graph, say an edge UV in this original graph, then they lie in a root to leaf path, okay? So you can convince yourself if you played the, uh, played the game that we saw in the previous slides, uh, then it will coincide with this definition of decomposition, okay? And your objective will be to find such a tree or uh, you can also have forest, uh, but the it varies just by plus one, okay? So the goal is to find such a tree or forest based on what you fix so that the depth is minimized. So, and yeah, here the best such F is the elimination. So now we'll understand what tree width of a graph is. Again, you measure the hardness of uh, your graph or the how complicated your graph is using a tree. But this time there is a different way of measuring how complicated it is. So what you do is you have your original graph G and you want to map, uh, you want to associate a tree and with every node of the tree, I'll be calling the vertices of the tree as nodes to distinct, so that there is no confusion. So for every node of the tree, you would like to associate some vertex subsets, okay? For instance, this node A is associated with vertex subset that contains vertices A, B, and C, okay? 
So you want, uh, you have a tree and you have vertex subsets associated with each of the nodes of the tree such that the following conditions are satisfied. So each vertex is contained in at least one bag. So the graph has to have some correspondence with the decomposition that you have. So every vertex must be covered. The second condition is if you look at any edge in the string, then there must exist at least one bag that contains both the endpoints. For instance, if you look at this edge AB, there is this bag that contains both A and B. So the nodes, the vertex subsets uh, associated with the nodes are also called as bags. Okay. And the third condition is that the vertices should not appear in a haphazard manner. If you fix any vertex V in the original graph and you look at the set of nodes uh, in whose bag the vertices appear, uh, this fixed vertex appears, then that must form a subtree of the uh, the tree that you have fixed. For instance, if you look at this vertex A, it appears in bag capital A, bag capital B, and bag capital D, which forms a subtree of the tree that you have fixed. So, such a decomposition is called as tree decomposition, and the width of this decomposition is simply bag size minus one. This minus one is just for political correctness. You want trees to have tree width one. Okay, so uh, this minus one has no role more than that. And the tree width is the best such width that you can achieve. Okay. So now um, let, let us move closer to the problem that we are considering. F deletion problem is uh, it, it encompasses several NP complete problems. So fix your favorite family of graphs F. And you can now define a problem called as F deletion problem where you have a graph G and a number K. And the question is, can you delete at most k vertices from the graph so that the resulting, uh, uh, the graph obtained after removing the vertices uh, from S is in your family F. Okay, so that is the F deletion problem. Now let me talk about the works that have inspired the work that we are doing. The first one is W tree with deletion. It is same as the F deletion problem where F is the family of graphs which have tree width at most W. So remember, it has the word width in its name. So I'll be using W. There will be some, some there will be one more letter. So remember this W, okay? Here, so the, go, the input is a graph G and a number K. And the question is, can you delete at most K vertices so that the resulting graph has, at mo, uh, has tree width at most W? So TW denotes tree width. So note that finding such a structures are also uh, alg uh, algorithmically very useful. For instance, if you try to do dynamic programming or uh, say you want to use cut and count based methods, you can actually put these vertices in each of the bags and for yes instances bound the, the tree with size, okay? So uh, finding such vertex subsets is often very useful. So the second part is on de-elimination distance, where you're given a graph G and a number K, and you want to delete at most K vertices from your graph, so that if you look at the remaining graph, it has tree depth at most, uh, give, uh, at most D, okay? So we are treating D as a fixed constant since um, it involves depth. So this is why there is a letter D. So for, the first problem, which is W tree with deletion, there is a kernel of size k to the order g of W. This kernel was designed by Fomin et al. And I'll not bother you with the definitions, but this is a non-uniform kernel. If you do not know the term non-uniform, that's okay. But uh, yeah, we ideally want something called as uniform kernels. And for D elimination deletion, we also have kernel whose size is something like f of d into k to the order one. So here the dependence of d is not in the exponent of k. And this was obtained by Gianna Palu et al. They also showed that in the kernel of Fomin et al, there is a dependence of w in the exponent of k. And this is unavoidable, not for the same function g of w, but the dependence of w here cannot be avoided under some uh, well-believed complex free theory co theoretic conjectures. So, okay, given these two results, 
we want to interpolate between these two problems so that as a special case we obtain uh, as a special case of the problem that we will be considering we obtain both the pr uh, previous results as a corollary so what we do is we define a problem called as dw elimination dele deletion where the input is a graph g and a number k and the goal is to check if we can delete at most k vertices from the graph so that in the resulting graph we can do the following we will play exactly the uh, the game that we saw towards the beginning of the talk but we will stop playing the game the moment we reach connected components whose tree width is bounded so the depth of the the tree the the game tree will be uh, we want it to be at most deep and each of these uh, remaining connected components where we do not play the game we want their tree width to be bounded by uh, w okay so note that this this kind of decomposition has been uh, in the recent times it has been in fashion and there are a lot of results relating to such uh, structures and yeah so this is the problem and essentially we stop eliminating once we reach graphs of tree width at most w otherwise it is exactly the same so if you notice if if you look at vertices in this connected component its neighbors can lie in the in the root to leaf path where we stopped okay so we truncate the tree after a certain point but that connected component can only have neighbors uh, from the point where we stop to the to the root so we will often refer to the game part as the interior part and the the place where we do not play the game as the exterior part of our this kind of decomposition okay so the question we were interested in is the problem that i uh, introduced in the previous slide does that problem has a kernel whose size is something like this okay so note that here uh, g of w we cannot avoid it because otherwise we will end up refuting the result of giannopolo et al that this dependence can be cannot be avoided okay so this dependence is unavoidable and here we allow function of d and w so we do not solve this problem completely however we solve it we almost solve it in an approximate sense we show that this problem admits a 1 plus epsilon approximate kernel where the size looks something like this for every fixed epsilon which is greater than 0 and recall for the w tree with deletion which is a special case of this problem so you can set d to be 0 and you get exactly the problem w tree with deletion if you set w to be 0 you get exactly d elimination del deletion problem okay so this is kind of a generalization of both these problems and you can although we do not exactly obtain the kernel but we approximately obtain these two kernels as a special case of our result so i said a term approximate kernel so i should define it because i haven't so i'll not bore you with formal details of the the exact definition but at least i'll give you a gist of what approximate kernel is so please don't take it as a formal definition this has some issues okay where some minor issues we'll work with minimization problem uh, where the goal is to minimize certain thing for our case it is the size of the vertex subset so what an approximate kernel is so fix your fix a parameterized optimization problem where optimization is you are trying to minimize something for our case the size of the vertex subset that we are deleting and fix an epsilon which is greater than 0 so a 1 plus uh, epsilon approximate kernel for the problem is now a pair of algorithms so the goal of first algorithm is to take an instance of the problem and output another instance of the problem but we want the size of the new instance to be quite small small in the sense in terms of the size of the, the in terms of the parameter so we want that the size of the new instance i prime k prime should be bounded by some g of k comma epsilon where g is some computable function okay so the goal of the algorithm r is to take such an instance output uh, another instance so that the new instance is small 
and this algorithm must do it in polynomial time. Now the approximation part, roughly speaking from the definition point of view, uh, comes into play where what the algorithm A is required to do is if you manage to solve the new instance, if you manage to uh, give or obtain a solution of reasonable size for the new instance, then it is required to output a solution for the original instance whose size is not too bad. Okay, So let's understand what we mean by that. If you look at the solution that you're given, so the algorithm A takes both the instances ik, which is the original given instance, the instance outputted by the algorithm R, and a solution for i prime k prime. So if you give a bad solution s prime for the, in, for the new instance, I am allowed to give a bad solution as well. Okay. Else, I am required to abide by the ratio that is achieved by the solution s prime. Okay. So if you give me a bad solution, uh, so if your s the ratio between the the solution that you are giving me and the best solution for i prime k prime is quite bad, I am also allowed to be that bad. And if you give me a reasonable solution, I am allowed to give up to one plus epsilon factor solution. Okay, so that is what the definition is. Uh, now I'll. Look, we will go over the proof sketch. Recall, we are trying to obtain that. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. So, uh, so if is but but the uh, uh, the solution on the output uh, of the kernel can be arbitrarily bad. So, so yes, in the, in which case we are also allowed to uh, output an arbitrary bad solution. But so then, the, then, what is preventing us from just out always outputting like you know, for any input output? You know, so, if you give me a good solution, S prime. The algorithm A is required to... Uh, oh, for any good, uh, any solution. Yes. yes. If your solution is not too bad, S prime is not too bad, I must also output a solution which is not too bad. But if a very bad solution is given, then I'll also output a very bad solution. So that's... Because we have to preserve approximation here. Okay. So now let us go over the proof sketch. So first we'll do some preparation in the graph. So we have our graph G. And let us look at a pair of vertices, S and T, distinct vertices. Say uh, this pair has does not have an edge between them, but lot of pairwise vertex disjoint paths, a high flow between, uh, between them. Okay. So in this case, we show that adding the edge ST is always safe. Okay. And the reason is the following. I'll try to communicate it intuitively. So if you have a high flow between a pair of vertices S and T, where we can quantify the high flow, here I'm just skipping uh, for, to keep it succinct, then we can show, we can prove one of the following. So either one of these two vertices is an S, okay? So notice that if one of, you delete one of these vertices S or T, then the S that you have does not even exist anymore in the remainder of the graph. So fine, it's a, uh, the edge exists or it doesn't exist, it doesn't matter, okay? Or you can prove that one of the vertices, say S, is in the interior part and the other vertex is in the exterior part, but it lies, it is associated with the root to leaf path where you can reach S via going to the leaf and to the root, okay? So edges of that form or both are in a bag in some decomposition, in which case the edge property, you the tree width property won't be violated. Or both are in the interior, but they are in ancestor descendant relationship, okay? So in either case, you can show that adding this edge between S and T does not hurt. So you can safely add the, such, an edge, su such an edge. And this will be useful in upcom uh, upcoming rules. Now, the way the algorithm proceeds is, we find a set S whose size is not too large, so that if you delete this subset of vertices, then your graph has the nice property. You have a small portion, small interior. We will prove that it has a small interior and exterior, but then it has a decomposition where this portion has at most, the interior has depth at most D, 
and then the remainder things have three width at most w okay but note that this s is of large size okay it does not uh, respect that it has to be some one plus epsilon factor away from the best solution so it is not you cannot return this as a solution because this is not a solution that satisfies the requirement of the problem so we will do something more now what we do is so we find such a deletion set which can be done in polynomial time for fixed uh, w and d similarly we find this decomposition which can also be done in reasonable amount of time and now what uh, we do is following approach of Fomin et al we can bound the maximum degree of a vertex in the interior part the tree that we have here the maximum degree of a vertex there can be bounded and notice that the moment you bound the degree of a vertex in f the size of this tree also gets bounded why because the depth is already bounded by d and then you are also bounding the degree so the overall number of vertices here can be bounded by uh, the size that we are allowed so now, next what we can show is after removing, sorry, this is yellow color and these are green colors. I, uh, these are of green color. I hope it's visible. So after removing a small subset of vertices, you can show that the number of components after removing the interior part can also be bounded by using an approach very similar to Fomin et al. But now we have to make some modification. So once we have done this, notice that the this set s is of bounded size z is of bounded size the interior part f is of bounded size and the number of such green things is bounded so now it remains to bound the size of each of these green green things and we will be able to bound the total number of vertices in the graph and uh, to do that uh, we can we can prove that these small components that we have uh, these okay not small yet these components form something called as near protrusion and to prove that they form near protrusion we use the property of the first rule that we have that between every pair of vertices that have high flow between them we always have an edge using that we can show that these small things form something called as near protrusion if they form something called as protrusion, there is no uh, nothing near no nearness in this. Then there are a lot of good rules, good reduction rules that allows us to reduce this portion of the graph. But since they form near protrusion, we cannot directly reduce their size. But we have to revert to approximation in order for us to uh, reduce their sizes. So essentially, what the, the, there is a known algorithm. What it does is it takes this near protrusion deletes it completely from the graph and replaces it by a very small graph okay that can be computed and that's how we do the replacement so there is a known black box that can output such replacements and we use that to reduce the size of these components and when we do that we lose the exact guarantee and we have to revert to approximation so this is the only step where we use approximation and using that we can bound the overall size uh, overall number of vertices in our graph and this gives us our result uh, that we have an approximate kernel for the problem. Okay, like I mentioned, we have uh, there is a discrepancy between the problem I stated and the result we obtain. So I'll end with the open question that can we obtain a really a polynomial kernel for this problem? And uh, yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you everyone for staying till the last talk. For those of you who celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone in advance. Questions? No questions? Okay. Then let's thank Akanksha, Jaldin, all the speakers, uh, the volunteers, organizers, and any closing remarks from Srikant? Are you there? Nothing? Okay. Then, yeah, have a safe trip back or see you at the workshop tomorrow and the day after. Thanks.